the most important thing otherwise. So yeah, we'll start off very soon with Daryl, um, followed by Ica, who's our UKN local network lead. And then we'll hear from Neil Jacobs, who's head of the UKN Open Research Programme. Uh, I've just realised, Ica, if you can hear me as well, that I did leave your, I didn't actually change the agenda after we discussed it. So you don't have to fill the 15 minutes, 10 is fine, as we discussed. Um, and just to say, really, that we do welcome questions as we go. So please do post any questions in the chat as you go, um, or answers, in fact, um, et cetera. Um, so we're just coming up to five past, and we're not doing too bad, bad on numbers, Dow. So I'll had, hand over to you, if that's all right. I'll stop my share. Great. Thanks uh, very much for that. Nick, so um, I assume people can see my slides. Yep, you can see them fine, Dal. Thank you. Great. Okay, so welcome everyone to this event. And really, this event is about kind of marking Leeds' role as a part of the UK Reproducibility Network. So I'm absolutely thrilled that Neil Jacobs is going to be here, is here today. And Neil's going to be updating a lot of the real details of what UKRN is about and its objectives. And, the major open research program. So what I've decided to do is do something slightly different today, which is I gave one of these open lunch um, presentations, actually, Nick, alarmingly two years ago nearly, um, which was very much about setting the case for open science and open research more generally. So what I'm going to do today in the next 15 minutes or so is just to try and um, give us a sort of sense of where we are at the moment and where we've come from and where we are, and then touch upon some of the things that we as the university have are going to be doing in terms of uh, our work with UKRN. But really then we've got lots of the detail will really be expanded upon by Neil explaining the whole open research program. So let's begin with uh, this whole notion that the scientific world has changed dramatically. So this is a slide that I often like to um, open with when I'm presenting uh, work on open research. And it's particularly because, you know, we recall way back in 2015, there was a crucial publication of um, a paper in science, uh, which clearly demonstrated that when we look at psychological science specifically, that this was the kind of landmark paper which indicated to many of us that replication was a problem within the discipline of psychological science. However, as I've led, I've explained before and, and I've said in other talks is that I still see this paper as you know, a major, major development, not just for psychology, but for all of science. And the reason for that is, is because psychology has been a trailblazer. And this particular paper, which was published uh, in 2015, demonstrated that only around 36% of studies could be replicated. But that was the kind of crisis point. Um, psychology performs much better than other sciences in terms of replication. And subsequent to this, there's been many other um, disciplines which have also engaged in similar projects. So the key point is that psychology has played a crucial role here. And myself as a psychologist feel very proud of our discipline being able to do that. But actually, as a result, over the last 10 years, since the, give or take that paper was published, and I should say there were other papers prior to that which were equally as important, but that particular science publication really was a landmark. But as a result, there's been so many fantastic developments subsequently. And I just want to touch upon a couple of these. So one is, I think, the huge increase in pre-registration. So I'm not going to get into the details. Either. If we want a full open science talk, um, that's for a different um, day and a different agenda. But basically, we know that one of the key concerns we have is the use of questionable research practices. But if we increase the use of pre-registration, this basically gets people to, in upfront, decide, well, which aspects of the work is confirmatory, which aspects is exploratory. So that's been an amazing development. And many psychologists and all, not just in psychology, all areas of science has been really increasing use of pre-registration. And indeed, we've recently published this template where we're trying to reach consensus on what is required, certainly in psychology, but many other disciplines are doing this as well. What is What do we really want to see in these pre-registrations? So again, this is a useful template. So that's been an amazing development. 
The other thing which has been fantastic um, has been this introduction of registered reports. And for those who are not familiar with registered reports, this is a relatively new phenomenon um, where peer review happens before the results are known. In fact, peer review should happen before you even start collecting data. And this, again, has been an, an extraordinary advance in all of science. But again, led by uh, Chris Chambers at Cardiff as a psychologist, again, making a huge difference um, on the international stage in all areas of science. And actually, if you look over the last um, 10 years or so, the very first registered report um, was published way back in uh, 2012, 2013 time. But if you can look here, this huge exponential increase in the number of uh, journals which offer registered reports as a format. And again, this is work that I've been involved in and many others um, and many who would be possibly on this call as well. So this is a really exciting advance as well. And again, those who are interested, I urge you to read this paper by Chambers, which gives us a real up-to-date on what he calls the evolution of registered reports. But actually, if you want to see some justification for this new way of working, I love this paper by Anne Scheel and colleagues where they compared uh, key psychological studies uh, which used the standard format with those which had used registered reports. And what you find here, if you look on the left-hand side of this bar, which I think is an extraordinary finding, you see that in a standard report, 95% of all first hypotheses are supported. I mean, that's quite a finding. I mean, that suggests that we are so extraordinary at our science that virtually every time we conduct something, we find it a significant effect which supports hypothesis. Clearly, we're not that good. Look what happens when we look at registered reports, where you do the peer review before the data collection happens. And you can see here that it drops to nearly 40%. And that's been replicated in another study very recently. So again, this is just a real um, eye-opener to the importance of moving to these new approaches. The other exciting thing, which we've all seen, is the introduction of open science badges. And what you can see, they were introduced way back in 2013, 2014, 2015 sort of time. And we can see the exponential increase again. This is now quite a, an old study, but it's still one of the key in this domain, where you can see this increase in sharing of data. So lots of really excellent developments. And I'm just touching upon some of them very briefly today. But actually, all isn't as rosy in the garden of open science and open research. And I wanted to share with you a really important uh, new study. I sorry, I jumped ahead there, which is currently under review and I may have been accepted. And I see Aika, our colleague here, um, was also one of the co-authors. So this is a piece of work which was done by the UKRN local um, network leads, which was a survey in the United Kingdom of open research practices. So what, where are we at? What's the, the state of, of play in both the context of awareness and also in the context of enabling and enacting open science um, behaviors and practices. And what's quite interesting here, if we just look at the slide here, it's, it's somewhat busy, but if you look at the left-hand side here, we can see this is a range of different open research practices from open access publication right down to registered reports. And then these orangey type bars are indications of the percentage of participants in this study of over a thousand people in the United Kingdom across all disciplines, whether or not they're aware of that. And then the green indicates whether or not they've enabled it. They've actually enacted and practiced any of these aspects. And what's concerning to me is that, well, first of all, what's good is that there's increases in awareness. But of some of the key real innovations, if you look at registered reports, this is less than 40%. So that's pretty concerning to me. And we can arrange even study pre-registration has only got a percentage of 51%. That's concerning to me. So even though we've, I've been certainly talking about this for many, many years, I've been an advocate of open science for about nearly 10 years now, but the point that's is crazy to me, and it, time and time again, it comes back to the same issue is we don't have the awareness levels that we would imagine, even all the stuff that's going on. And if you look at the right and the green, we can see here equally there is, I suspect, relatively low levels of enactment. Again, look at registered reports, less than 10%, replication studies, 16%, pre-registration, only 25%. So that's concerning to me. So there's a lot of work that we still need to do. And in fact, we just had completed another similar survey in psychological science as a registered report this time. And we pretty much mirror the findings of the Norris et al paper. Again, hopefully this will be published pretty soon. But the thing which concerns me 
Equally um, is this whole idea of the architecture of science and the reward structure. And this is the idea of what about these important things which are in that landscape that we all work in. And again, I wrote about this a couple of years ago. Um, and again, if you're interested, you can read this particular paper, but myself and many others have been talking about how we need to move to a more open and transparent culture for quite some time. And it is clear that science remains broken in terms of culture and in terms of reward. And if we look at this, these two nice slides coming up what, from Brian Nozak, um, who obviously is one of the world leaders in this area. And Brian was talking about this earlier in the year where he, he describes this idea of this dysfunctional research structure that we that exists. The idea that we can incentives for novel, positive and tidy outcomes. And this yields all sorts of concerns from selective reporting, questionable research practices, reduction in sharing, et cetera. And then that has a cascading effect, which ultimately leads to increased research waste, slow progress, and per return on investment. And what we still need to do is we need to change this to improve the reward system. And indeed, you know, the ultimate goal is these incentives should be for rigor and high quality methodology. And as you can see here, this would then promote complete reporting, transparency in all aspects of research, both during the process, afterwards, and in replication. And as you can see, this they would then cascade to lead to less waste, more progress, and more return on investment. However, what's interesting to me is that leads have been actually a trailblazer in themselves. And this is where I need to shout out to the extraordinary and brilliant work by Kat Davies, our Dean for Research Culture, and Amanda Bretman, our Dean of Research Quality. Leeds had a view a number of years ago, around the same time that we were trying to join the UKRM, to really try and change the culture. And any colleagues who are either both internal to the university or external, if you haven't seen our research culture strategic plan, if you just Google it, and I'm sure someone could cleverly put it in the chat um, while I'm speaking, I'd urge you to read it, or to read it, sorry, because again, it really sets this fantastic scene for where we're at um, in terms of uh, moving to a more transparent and open culture. However, I think what we, what we were doing at the same time that that document was being written was we joined the UKRM. And the UKRM, when Neil um, Jacobs will give us a lot of detail on many aspects of the program very soon, but basically it's a peer-led consortium, which is trying to change and transform the higher education um, landscape. So it's a top-down as well as a bottom-up um, approach. So the idea that we're trying to work with HEIs across the entire United Kingdom um, in a way where we can try and improve quality, improve training, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll see more about that in a second. But from a Leeds point of view, what I've been keen on since we joined last November was to really engage as much as we can with some of the key aspects which will make a difference both to Leeds, but also to this sector overall. And indeed, this is just a brief overview of what the five-year open research program um, that, that UKRN has been funded by, by Research England. And again, it's sort of a training, evaluation, and sharing of resources. And again, Neil will explain that in detail when he presents very shortly. But a part of that work, what I was keen is there's two key bits that I want to share with you today, which are most pertinent to where we're at. One is that I was keen for us to get involved in what's called the Open and Responsible Researcher Reward and Recognition Project. This is one of the, one of the key projects in the overall Open Research Program, which is led by colleagues in Cardiff. And the reason why I think this is important, because as I was alluding to earlier, given that we've got, we still have this biased and somewhat broken research culture in the sense that the incentive scheme and the, and the reward structure in UK science is remains problematic. We don't reward and we don't incentivize the open research practices enough. And ultimately, the best way to change a behavior is to change the incentive structure. And I think the way we evaluate research and, and, and all aspects of open science and open research is crucial here. So one of the things that we've we've started in the first meeting was last week, where was this particular um, reward and recognition project, and Leeds will be one of the, all being well, will be one of the um, case study institutions, where over the next um, two years, there'll be a lot of work going on, both internally and externally, where we're gonna try and achieve these objectives, where we try and embed uh, researcher reward and recognition in a more responsible way. 
And again, I don't expect you to read all this details now, but the idea there'll be a process of trying to decide how we best assess this. We're going to be looking at you know where we are at the moment in terms of our maturity in, in relation to uh, responsible reward and recognition. And again, we'll be moving on to hopefully agree this at, a, at an institutional and then also at a national level. But again, we'll hear more about that as that project develops. But the other thing which we've been um, keen to be involved in is how do we assess open research? What are the best open research indicators? And what the United uh, the, the UK RN did a little while ago, they had a, 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 a they had a survey in the in the HEA sector to try and identify what the four main open research indicator priorities are. Again, we don't have time to talk about this within the context, for example, of REF, but REF 2028, we know that research culture is key, but also um, how we assess and evaluate openness um, will become even more important. And as a result of the survey, there were four key priorities identified. How do we best assess institutional levels open and fair data? So the extent to which you're engaging with that, data accessibility statements, pre-registration, and the use of the credit system. And, and actually what's extraordinary, and again, Neil Mayer may not talk about this when he speaks shortly, what I've been impressed by a, is, first of all, to establish these priorities, but really has impressed me was then working with solution and providers from right through all aspects of the publishing, you know, from PLUS through to Elsevier to many different organizations are now working with UKRN to kind of come up with the best way on how we can easily, robustly, fairly, and accurately assess these different um, key indicators of open research. So that's pretty much where we are now. So all I would leave you to say is, and I'm happy to take any questions later, is let's just watch this space because hopefully over the next couple of years, we will be moving in an exciting way, working, of course, with, you know, I should say all the professional services, with you know, the library services, Claire and Nick and Sally Dalton, and, and then, of course, with uh, Amanda Bretman and also with Kat Davies, as a whole team and anybody else. And Ike and I will be hopefully working on this over the next number of years. So and I hope you enjoy that really nice photograph that I took flying back from Ireland only a couple of weeks ago. I will leave it there. That is 15 minutes right on the nose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daryl, and excellent time. And uh, thanks for the photo. And uh, so hopefully, Ike, you should be able to share your slides if you want to go next. As I say, though, I'd left you 15 minutes on the agenda. You don't have to fill it all. You can if you like. I agree. Less time for Q&A. I will take them up, I think. So let me just try and share this. I hope this does work. Can you see this? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Ike. All right, then. Yeah, welcome, everyone. It's great to, to have so many people in the room here to, to talk about UK RAN and how it increasingly connects to our work at, at Leeds. Uh, uh, I think there is no... Uh, my uh, three comments will uh, sort of connect seamlessly with uh, with what Daryl just talked about because what, what I will uh, want to do here is mostly to uh, introduce you to the uh, bottom up local community uh, that is uh, sort of trying to integrate uh, the various voices uh, and, and you know, sort of researchers and professional staff across campus uh, who share an interest in all of the things, uh, things that uh, Daryl just touched on, all the various uh, aspects of, of open research and uh, so tra open transparency and uh, integrity in, uh, in, in doing the work we do, whatever shape or form it might take, and, uh, which discipline we hail from. So uh, just briefly to say that uh, uh, what we are, again, is a really diverse uh, and hopefully maximally open open research community uh, that is uh, trying to be as inclusive as possible uh, horizontally and vertically. I'm talking to you today because I'm uh, sort of acting as the local network lead for, for, our, uh, for our leads uh, UK RAN network. Uh, I'm a lecturer in uh, politics and in, in media and politics at the School of Politics and International Studies. Um, so I'm a social scientist, uh, but uh, our network uh, compo is composed of at current 212 leads, academic and professional staff members, uh, which, as I said, all share an interest in research transparency and rigor, and they come from all seven faculties at, uh, at the university. So we are a really diverse bunch, which makes for um, 
really interesting and I think I find a stimulating environment to have these open research discussions in. So uh, ours is a really open open research space. I, I dare say and so. At the moment, uh, our our network, uh, like I said, is a is a bottom up a researcher led uh, or is a grassroots led uh, initiative, um, and it fulfills two main functions in my view, which uh, is to offer leads academics uh, in, and and professional staff as well uh, more information about uh, the uh, sort of rapidly developing uh, uh, discussions around uh, open research uh, in leads. Uh, around in the UK and around the world indeed. Uh, so uh, offering a space for information there and also to offer a community around these uh, issues sort of uh, in a uh, possibility and opportunity for uh, for lead uh, people interested in open research to find like-minded uh, people. So, so it's, to interrupt, I, I, I'm just, you, you sl sound slightly robotic. It's not too bad, but I just wonder maybe if your camera off might help with the bandwidth possibly. Um, uh, okay, well, I, I can try to move closer to the microphone. Otherwise, uh, I don't we, think we can hear you. But it is slight, slight. It, it sounds like um, a network thing that it's slightly robotic. But we can, we can hear you. Sorry to interrupt. So does it? Yeah, you can hear me. I hope. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, we can hear you. It's just uh, the quality is not great, but it's okay. Sorry to interrupt. Carry on. Okay, sorry for that. Uh -huh. It won't be, uh, I won't take too much time anyway. Anyways, uh, so uh, you can join us if you are lead uh, academic or professional staff uh, and you're not yet part of our MS te uh, Microsoft team, you can join us via this link. Um, if you want to join the wider open research uh, discourse at Leeds. So uh, we're sharing information there and you will learn about uh, Sort of news, uh, the latest uh, publications in uh, in open research. So I share each uh, each, uh, each end of the week you know, of what I call the Open Research Friday reading, uh, which is a, a means of uh, familiarizing leads academics with the latest uh, and greatest publications in the in the open research space. Um, we share job opportunities, uh, open research events at Leeds and beyond. Um, and uh, information about uh, the latest uh, developments in open research in, in general, such as published reports, uh, parliamentary reports uh, that come uh, that have come out this year, for example, uh, recordings of open research talks, etc. Uh, and also we flag uh, uh, other communities of interest uh, to open research-minded people, uh, such as Ford, Project T, and so on. So we're trying to connect uh, lead, uh, leads to these uh, the transnational. Uh, Sort of communities of open, uh, within open research, um, and hopefully, uh, therefore, positioning leads uh, you know, within that wider community as well. Um, so that's information. The community aspect of it is uh, mostly realized at the minute through our uh, monthly reproducibility uh, session. So, reproducibility, uh, for those of you who are, are not uh, aware, is a, a social. A, a, uh, journal club format, which uh, which uh, has been around for quite a few uh, years now and uh, is practiced uh, at uh, or present at many campuses around the world. Um, here in Leeds, uh, we uh, used for reproducibility to offer a space for our, like I said, horizontally and vertically inclusive community uh, of open research uh, interested people. The current team uh, is uh, is really as diverse as the community at large. I think we come from uh, very different uh, faculties uh, and, and therefore are representative of uh, different uh, perspectives. And uh, we are in our fifth year. Uh, if you uh, want to become active within reproducibility as well, so we're mostly ECRs uh, in in this team. Uh, if you want, uh, but yeah, never mind. If you're ECR or not, if you're interested in uh, in Joining uh, the Journal Club uh, organization uh, in Leeds, you're very welcome to reach out to us and become a uh, member. So uh, we now have events every month uh, during the teaching semester, uh, and they're usually hybrid. The next one is tomorrow, uh, and it's about a paper uh, where we will uh, discuss a paper informally, but uh, having an informal discussion about uh, a paper that's uh, uh, all about uh, the role of uh, open science for early career researchers and how they can run into challenges or also help promote open, open science uh, in general. So that's tomorrow. There's a link to register there. 
there's going to be another uh, reproducibility that's a little bit going ahead uh, that I'm really looking forward to uh, for and that I want to flag right now because I'm so excited about it, which is uh, going to happen in March uh, next year, where we will welcome Crystal Steltenfold, who's the training edu and education manager at the Center for Open Science, who hosts the, the Open Science Framework, in which we will talk about uh, qualitative uh, methods and open science practices, which is something she, she published a very interesting paper about quite recently. So uh, stay tuned for more information about this particular event, uh, which will be great to have a cost representative at Leeds. And yeah, what does the future hold? Uh, we will aim to further develop the network, uh, sort of hopefully expanding it, but also deepening perhaps our, uh, our conversations. And uh, by that, I mean that in addition to circulating ever more information, for, uh, continuing to provide uh, spaces for community to perhaps also uh, sort of go there by the way, in the way of uh, starting actual leads based collaborations uh, of various sorts from within the, uh, the local network. And that might include meta research projects, which some of us have been involved in, as Daryl already mentioned, organization of additional events, or even uh, developing resources uh, for. Uh, uh, open research in the various communities uh, and faculties on uh, on campus, uh, which is something I think we will need to uh, engage in more going forward. So there's more to happen. Uh, again, if you're interested, please join us and just click the logo below uh, to join our Microsoft team. Thank you very much. Thanks, Icon. I'm sorry if I put you off your stride a bit there with uh, coming in halfway through, but uh, I, was, I just wouldn't your audio it was fine it was just a slightly off so um that's the two support acts i guess neil um if you're there you're uh, the headliner um if you can share any slides you've got i will do i don't like being billed as a headliner that's not <laughs> fair on me or on Daryl and Ica. um and what Ica was too modest to mention was that he's just been elected to be a member of the uh, Central Steering Group or Supervisory Board of the UK Reproducibility Network. So he's got a national role uh, steering steering the whole thing. So thank you very much, Ica, for uh, agreeing to stand for that. And congratulations on, on being appointed to that role. So I'm going to say a little bit about the UK Reproducibility Network and some of the things that we're doing. I'm going to mainly talk about um, the open research program, but Daryl's done such a good job of introducing that that I can skip over some of that reasonably fast, perhaps. So what is the UK Reproducibility Network? It's a, it's a network of different, different communities. So that's researchers and institutions and funders and publishers and others, all of whom have an interest in improving research, uh, improving the quality, rigor, transparency of, of research. And UKRN is a platform to enable us to collaborate enable that to happen. Far too much competition in the sector already. UKRN is about collaboration. So I'll say a few words about um, if I can make the slides work. Some some activities that we, we're uh, doing to enable that to happen. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about cross disciplinary perspectives and then talk about research culture and research integrity and then get on to open research. So I hope that's interesting and, and uh, I'll look forward to questions. So I wanted to start off by talking about reproducibility and transparency across different disciplines because there is a tendency sometimes for these conversations to get a little bit sort of quantitative, a little bit STEM heavy. Um, and I don't think that's necessary in the slightest. We've already heard examples of why that uh, isn't the case. Um, here's a blog post. Is, uh, is history having a replication crisis? This is from Anton Howes, who we, we spoke to as the UKRN uh, a few months ago. There may well be some interesting conversations to be had there as about the ways in which history is, uh, or different kinds of history are practiced. Only last week, the UK Reproducibility Network partnered up with the British Psychological Society and the Practice Research Advisory Group. So these are arts practitioners, so theatre people, music people, uh, sculptors and others, uh, to look at the ways in which they talk about transparency and positionality and what does reproducibility mean in those sorts of disciplines. Really interesting conversation. There'll be a report coming out of that in the next uh, few weeks. And we're just starting actually to learn from uh, a range of different disciplines, including the humanities thinking here, we have a story associate just starting at the arts and, uh, at the, the UK RN funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. 
and they're bringing in scholarship about story and narrative theory to see whether or not we can find better ways for research researchers to tell the story in journal articles for example or in books to tell the story of research to tell it more accurately and more uh, more completely um, there is a, a tendency i think when research is reported to always report a very clean narrative uh, as Daryl said, we always find what we were looking for in uh, what our first hypothesis was. Can we find ways from perhaps uh, story and narrative to tell better, more accurate, more truthful stories about all of the messiness that goes into research? And of course, open science and open research, which is what we're talking about today, mainly looks very different in different disciplines. And this is a sort of a, a section from a web page we have on the UKRM page and this is built out of work done at the University of Surrey to provide resources and case studies and reference points in a whole range of different subject areas to show what open research looks and feels like in those different discipline areas broadly following the ref units of assessment there uh, and of course some of the the case studies that have been developed at Leeds feature in these pages too but I want to talk briefly and take a detour through research culture uh, and you might wonder why I want to do that there's a whole lot of conversations around research culture of course at the moment across the sector um, and I want to do that because I want to highlight these sorts of findings this is a finding from a very large survey of research integrity that came out in 2021 and this was quoted in the UK Committee on Research Integrity annual statement from uh, this year and there are some really quite startling figures here I think so these are uh, self-reported figures, and obviously there's an incentive perhaps for people not to report some of these things. They are not, uh, not positive aspects of, of research. So including authors who haven't contributed sufficiently, over half of researchers reported having done that, not conducting a thorough review of the manuscripts, uh, choosing only to uh, not to report findings if they contradict your theories. One in five reported doing that. So these are really quite startling figures, at least they are to me. And they suggest that we're working in a, in a culture that doesn't necessarily reward the kinds of good, rigorous, high quality research that we're all interested in doing. There's a, a difference between what we're incentivized to do and what we have sort of intrinsic motivations to do as researchers. That tells me that there's something amiss in research culture. And this is one of the things, of course, that the, the REF is trying to address. The early decisions for REF 2028 suggested a far greater emphasis uh, and closer review of the cultures in which research is done. And there has been a lot of discussion around those proposals. And uh, some people were keen to maintain the focus on research outputs as being the sort of measure of excellence. But I think Gemma argues quite cogently in this piece uh, from about a month ago, that really that opposition to changing the way the ref works really shows why, why that change is needed, why that change in culture is needed and that needs to be reflected in the ways in which the sector is assessed through things like the research excellence framework. So what is UKRN doing about all of this? Um, and there's quite a lot on that slide, and I don't want to go through all of these things, but I will mention uh, quickly four, five, six, and seven here. So one of the things that we're doing is we're just convened or, or just starting a project co-funded by, uh, uh, by some UKRN institutions, including Leeds, um, who are interested in the ways in which universities use research evidence when they're making decisions or developing strategies that affect research culture. So do we as institutions use the kind of research evidence that we're, we're very good at creating? Do we actually use that evidence ourselves? So that's a, a piece of work that's just starting now. Uh, I think it'll be a very interesting piece of work. We are working with the UK Committee on Research Integrity, looking at point five here, on just looking at what the literature says about the enablers and inhibitors of research integrity. And this is work that we're doing with, with two of our uh, local network leads, people like ICA at different institutions, in this case at Wolverhampton and Salford, are working on this literature review for the UK Committee on Research Integrity. We've uh, worked together to draft a response to those REF 2028 initial decisions, and we have outlined what we feel as UKRN to be an excellent research environment, the sort of research environment that is conducive to high quality research, and that's published 
now on our website and we'll be talking with the UK Committee on Research Integrity indeed tomorrow about some of those, those points that uh, we feel are important. And the final thing I'll just mention is that we have got UKRI funding this year for a community support project to support the work that people like ICA are doing across the 70 institutions that have got local network leads uh, to make sure that they, they, they feel supported by UKRN uh, and are able to develop a, a peer community of practice across the country doing that sort of work. I'm going to skip this slide because uh, we can come back, if that piques your interest, we can come back to that in the, the Q&A at the end. Um, so I'll just leave it there for a second or two to see whether it does. But I want to talk about open research. That's the, the billing for today. Um, and what do we mean by open research and why? Uh, a shameless piece of self-promotion you might have seen in uh, Research Professional News today, this piece that I, I've written about the international context and the international context comprising us rejoining Horizon Europe, of course, but also there's uh, work coming out of UNESCO and coming out of the United States. There's a global movement towards open research, which the UK really needs to be a part of. We have been a leader. Uh, and in many places we are still a leader, uh, but there's a lot of activity in other places now, and uh, we've, we uh, have, have got our work cut out to maintain that leadership position, I think. So what do we mean by open research? This is a graphic from the UNESCO Open Science recommendation from, uh, from last year. Uh, it sets out a whole range of things that they mean by open research. So there are things that we typically understand, perhaps scientific publications, data, open access, perhaps open source and code, pre-registration would be up there. And this is what they call open scientific knowledge. But there are three other quadrants to that, uh, that round there. Uh, open science infrastructures, engagement with societal actors. So this is where public participation and citizen science might fall and open engagement and dialogue with other knowledge systems as well. So for them, open science is a really broad canvas in which research is operating. And we've been working with UNESCO and with the Swiss Reproducibility Network to produce a guide that will, will be released this week, actually, at the UNESCO General Assembly a guide for institutions who want to implement these recommendations from, from UNESCO. And they are recommendations that are signed by 194 national governments, including the UK government, so they are ones that uh, we should be paying close attention to. Um, quickly mention the third bullet point here before I go on to the Open Research Programme. The third bullet point here is, is another project that we're just starting again with with support uh, from the University of Leeds, among other UK RN institutions, uh, to look at the ways in which universities have found it easy or not to put in place arrangements to uh, support research data, open research data. So things like the training, the infrastructure, the guidance, the support, the kinds of things that universities need to do to make it easy for researchers to share fair and open research data under the, uh, the sort of commitments that the Open Research Data Concordat sets out. Uh, how easy has it been for institutions to do that? And are there lessons that we can share? And are there ways in which we can inform national policy making uh, to make sure that it's uh, in line with what, what really universities are uh, able, able to do in that way? So that, that project's just starting off now. Uh, again, a piece of meta research that the UKRN is doing. But I'll crack on and talk about the Open Research Programme now. It's now got 22 universities and growing uh, as part of it. And you can see there the four main sort of strands of work, training, reform of recruitment, promotion, and appraisal, uh, sharing of institutional practice, and some work around evaluation, meta research, and, and indicators. So I'll skip through some of these things uh, on training. We have now got a train the trainer program in place this is designed to to build up institutional capacity uh, as part of our sustainability model so that institutions have uh, a range of trainers available uh, for researchers to train their peers for professional services staff to also train in a whole range of different aspects of open research and we sort of set those out in this graphic according to sort of a, a broad research life cycle if you like uh, there's a schedule online now. We uh, have uh, a set of uh, training, train the trainer sessions that are 
running over the course of the next two or three years and more will be added to that. I suggest uh, if you're interested, have a look at the schedule on the UKRM website. We're also building up a community of trainers, a national community of trainers, so that we can um, share good practice or enable good practice to be shared among those trainers uh, so that we really do have the best uh, open research training in the world, if we, if we possibly can do that. So that's the training. I won't go into too much detail about the specific training that's available. We can come back to that if you're interested. I do want to talk about this, though, and uh, Daryl's already mentioned this is uh, a major uh, announcement today, actually, um, of the 43 institutions that are joining the, the OR4 project as either case studies, as in the case of Leeds, or parts of the community of practice, uh, to reform the ways in which staff are recruited, are promoted, and are appraised to make sure that open research practices are recognised in these programs. 43 institutions, a huge diversity of institutions there from the Royal College of Music to the University of Cambridge uh, to the Cancer Research UK's Scottish Institute. So, I mean, a really vast range and a really significant uh, number of institutions representing, taken together, over 80,000 researchers across the UK sector. So this is a, a really major movement among a wide range of institutions to reform the ways in which uh, they recruit and promote staff so that researchers can be confident that uh, the kinds of open research practices that you do at Leeds will also be recognised should you, God forbid, look for a job at another university. Um, they, this will be supported by um, a, a sort of maturity framework uh, and a guide to help institutions implement uh, implement these reforms and plan the ways in which they would want to make those sorts of improvements over time. So that's a, a huge piece of work, a major achievement, I think, by the, the team uh, that have been working on that. The fourth aspect of the Open Research Programme that I'll, I'll quickly mention is a more general approach that we're trying to take to enable universities to share good practice among themselves. So to find out you know, what are your peer institutions doing to support open research by way of training, guidance, infrastructure, tools, statements of principle, and so on. So we will be developing, we have developed some static pages. Here's the wonderful King's College London. Um, we are developing those into what we would like to call a living website. So something a bit more dynamic than that, that enables a community of, of change agents across these institutions to learn from each other and share good practice over time. That's something that we'll have in place within the next year or so. And the final thing I'll talk about, the strand of work here we call evaluation design, but broadly speaking it's about how do we know that we're making the changes that we think we're making and that we intend to make. Uh, there's been a, a large-scale survey there uh, that many institutions have run. Uh, we are keen to bring a little bit more coordination to the world of surveys. We think there's clearly a lot of surveys out there. Researchers are not under surveyed. Uh, Daryl mentioned the brief open research survey that Charlotte Pennington and others ran. We, as UKRN, as part of the Open Research Programme, ran a survey. There are also surveys put out by the Centre for Open Science and by individual institutions such as Oxford with working to try to get a little bit of coordination into that landscape. Maybe we can have some common question sets or, or similar sorts of survey instruments over time. Um, but the thing I really want to mention here, and this is something that Daryl's introduced already, is the Open Research Indicators pilots, which about 15 institutions are going to be joining in, including Leeds. Um, and they are intended to be an exploration to find out whether we can, we can indeed reliably, ethically, practically, uh, and validly measure different aspects of open research. So here's my rather clunky graphic to try and describe that. We have a number of institutions together, as I say, about 15, who are forming a community about uh, uh, looking into this topic. Um, we have a number of partners, solutions providers, if you like, who will be working with these institutions, uh, combining their sort of third party data and expertise with the, the expertise and data from the institutions themselves. Uh, looking at those uh, those topics. So can we find 
reliable and valid indicators of progress on these things. But the thing I'd really like to stress about this is that this is indicators to help institutions plan and evaluate their progress, their support for open research practices. These are not indicators to inform research or researcher assessment. So these will be aggregate and anonymous indicators. They will not be individual uh, indicators that can inform sort of those sorts of recruitment and promotion type type activities. I think those two uh, should be kept as, as distinct as they possibly can. So that's all I had to say, to be absolutely honest. I hope that's been a useful skip through some of the work that we're doing, and we've got time for some discussion and some questions. Thanks very much, Neil. And uh, I was going to hand over to you, Arco, I think, for Q&A. Is that OK? Absolutely OK. Um, uh, I'll first of all thank Neil for, uh, for giving this uh, overview of uh, the, the multiplicity of, uh, of differing, different work streams uh, within UKRN. Um, after uh, Darren has given uh, a broad overview of the uh, of the general concerns that uh, that motivate uh, UK Rens work, so now I'd be interested to know if uh, if you have any questions for either uh, Daryl or Neil. If so, please just raise your hand or speak up right away. There is one question uh, like I've noticed in oh, the okay. chat about um, fees for. Um... Pre-registration, I think. In, I, yeah, so, Nick, so. I saw that it's from Mel in my department. It's a good point, Mel. I, I didn't think, I thought there were some which were, didn't attract a fee. So does clinical trials, the clinical golf trials, sorry, the, the American version, I didn't even, I thought the UK version, which is what you've cited, didn't, didn't cost. So if you looked at it recently, it, it did cost something. Yeah, so can you hear me, Daryl? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's about a £250 pre registration fee, but it's also a particular pre registration that NHS ethics tends to almost require, actually, as part of their ethical approval process. Um, and I did inquire about this within the school, and they said I have to come up with the funding myself to pre register if there's a funding. Um, if, if there's cost involved but I can see how you know that could put people off pre-registering given in some situations there might be a fee involved um, which you know is down to the individual. I mean currently of course if you use the open science framework there would be no cost attached to that it's just well or not the funder or the NHS would be happy with it. It's a good point actually because you know in fact you're right in, in the past when I've done it it's just been part of a grant so it, the cost has been there so but um, I mean, the other way of doing it, of course, Mel, is you publish the protocol and then that becomes pre-registered. Yeah, um, but sometimes can, it's a chicken well. and egg situation yeah. though. To publish the protocol, you might need the pre-register. Oh, so sometimes there's, um, but yeah, I'll look into it a bit more, a bit yeah. more. Maybe I can find an alternative that's free. That's it, it just strikes me that point as well might be something that we in the library might need to consider. I don't want to put, my uh claire knowles on the spot and i think if you're still there claire but in terms of open access fees i mean there might be a danger of int journals introducing these additional fees as we know they are tending to do for all sorts of value add at the moment and while we're now increasingly covering open access um fees to publish then you know if more journals took up uh registered reports and we're charging additional fees for that and that's something i think we in the library might want to be aware of I don't know if you wanted me to respond, Nick. But I think well, yeah, if you can do, if you want, Claire, I didn't want to put you on the I spot. think we always need to be aware of what the costs are and keeping these costs manageable. I know Neil used to work for JISC and um, our negotiations go through JISC and understanding what the costs are and transparency of them and that we don't get costs for one thing and then another added on, as we've seen with colour charges and things like this. The final cost needs to be the final cost. And that's both for planning, but also making sure it is manageable and transparent. Obviously, we get some funding here in the UK from um, UKRI, but we have to be aware that not everybody's that fortunate in other places as well. Claire, can I just come back with one just quick thing? Just just come back to Mel's broader point. So, but don't forget, you know, any type of pre-registration can be free on as predicted, or or there's many other platforms 
where you can do it very easily. And I urge everyone to use as predictive if you want a quick and easy route, which is there's less barriers there. And then the registered report idea, which is entirely transparent, and most journals offer that for free. So in i.e., it's part of the subscription model. It's different if it's, of course, it's an open access journal. You'd have the open the APC to be paid. I don't know, um, Neil. Do you have anything to offer on that? No, I don't really. I think you've covered it, uh, Daryl. And yeah, yeah. I think uh, just to add to this, uh, this excellent question that I think uh, flags for us also a need to provide an overview institutionally for our leads researchers of the various options that are available uh, for sort of engaging with these uh, sort of open practices. Right? So, so that's a, a really helpful uh, question more generally. Thanks. Uh, how do we inform our researchers about what's possible and, and so on. I saw there was a question uh, by Andy uh, in, in the chat as well uh, about uh, uh, sort of collaboration between uh, our local network lead and, and other uh, campuses uh, in Leeds. Uh, uh, I, to be honest, there hasn't been uh, any in collaboration so far. I, I am aware there is a there is a local network lead, uh, no, a local network at Leeds Beckett as well. There's actually an interesting thought to try and reach out to uh, to them to see what they're up to. I, to be honest, I have no idea <laughs> what's uh, what's happening with, uh, at Leeds Beckett. But um, if you have any thoughts or ideas for what it is that we could or should do there. Uh, very happy to to uh, to talk and, and, and see what we can organize uh, in Leeds more widely. Oh, what was the background of your of your question? Perhaps you can say a little bit about that, Andy. Just a, there was a question from uh, Andy Turner as well. Like I should enable the chat the the question function really, shouldn't I? Because they've sort of disappeared back up the chat thread. Uh, but Andy, a colleague from Research Computing, do you want to ask in person, Andy? I can see you there. Yeah, so that's that's what I was talking about. So <clears throat> I think when I met with Daryl and um, you were just coming to the university in 2013, and um, we talked about setting up um, this Leeds UKRN node as a thing for the city, sort of, mm. or city region. Um, and at the time, there were four universities that were sort of working out of Leeds a little bit. The Open um, University has got its base somewhere else now, and it's shut the office in Leeds. But there's three universities, really. Um, I don't know what's going on with Trinity, but obviously we've got a contact there that's on the UKRN list of Sophia in Leeds Beckett. But then, you know, that's all academic and there's a lot of research that goes on in other parts of um, the city as well. So I thought about it as a more regional thing rather than um, sort of ivory tower thing. But um, yeah, I, I I don't know if if other, other places have got somewhere to join, um, you know, so if you worked in a hospital or if you worked in a in a business or something whether you could be part of this yeah like like i said our general ethos is to be as open as possible so yes. reaching out beyond our campus absolutely uh, something i would be quite open to as well so if you have i mean contacting sphere absolutely it might be a worthwhile thing to do um also if you have other points of contact uh, that you would like us to explore I think would be worthwhile uh, sort of using to expand our reach uh, yeah please feel yeah. free to send over to me and I'll, I'll pick it up it could be that Nick knows Sophia because he came from Leeds Beckett and Helen as well who, who's working in the same team but I don't know I know the name I'm not sure I've ever met Sophia but yeah we'll definitely follow up with Ellie I mean it's one of those things we keep trying to do more so um I've got a question um Ike if that's okay probably for yes, sure, sure, sure. Please go ahead. For, for Neil really on behalf of um uh Alex uh, Robertsburg who's actually in the office with me when we were just talking a little bit um I think you touched on it perhaps Neil, a little bit with the uh, UNESCO stuff, but um, Alexa and I were just talking in the office that there seems to be perhaps an emphasis on publications. And as head of public engagement here at Leeds, Alexa, I think, was interested in the broader sense that you were sort of alluding to with um, the UNESCO stuff. Is that something that UKN explicitly will will start to focus on, or is it is it really sort of the publication focus that that you focused on? So I think um, I'm going to answer that by saying that 
the UKRN's focus is on the research process and by way of making that process more rigorous, making the outputs more rigorous. And if that process needs to be participatory in order for the research to be rigorous, then UKRN is interested in it. Does that make sense? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. She's nodding. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we hope very much that there will be a, um, a new primer coming out on um, public participation and engagement in research as a part of the UKRN primer series reasonably soon. Oh, I will just ask that question as well, Neil, if that's all, all right, because you did refer to the Wikimedia and Open Research Primer, so I just wondered when that might be progressed. <laughs> There's Which one, one the Wikimedia one. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. It's just you mentioned it in the in the uh, in in the slide, and uh, I meant to bug you about that anyway. So. Uh, okay, I'll I'll have a look at that this afternoon. I'm sorry <laughs> if I've held that up, Nick. Any other questions in, in the in the virtual room uh, for for Neil or Daryl or even myself? No, doesn't seem like it. Um, I don't know, Nick, if you want to say any final words uh, today, we are almost at the end of the hour. Yeah, no, we're at the hour. Thank you very much to all three of our speakers, um, who, of course, aren't um, supporting acts and headliners. They're all uh, entirely equal, as in uh, as we're trying to promote in terms of research as well. Um, but thank you very much for uh, coming along to everybody and to to to, to our speakers and for uh, interacting. And, you know, we certainly at Leeds, and I'm sure colleagues from other universities are happy to keep the conversation going in whatever channels are appropriate. So yeah, please stay in touch. I'll stop the recording and I can certainly hang around for a few minutes because I always think it's a little strange to uh, just close the recording down straight